uh, EU trade policy. Um, for this event, we have the pleasure to welcome four very distinguished speakers. Valdis Dombrovkis, Executive Vice President of the European Commission and Good Commissioner morning. for Trade. Bernd Lange, Chair of the European Parliament Committee on International Trade, Member of the European Parliament from the SND uh, Group. Lucy Parker, Partner of the Brunswick Group, Strategic Advisor to Senior Leadership. And James Thornton, founding CEO of Client Earth. In addition, I will have uh, the honor and pleasure to moderate this session with Pascal Lamy, former commissioner for trade and former head of WTO. It is with him and thanks to, to his great experience and knowledge that Europe Jacques Delors has launched a series of paper on greening trade uh, policy almost three years ago, including a CBAM template as early as June 2020. Why are we having uh, this discussion today? Trade is still too much associated with unsustainable levels of resource consumption, contributing to climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. Trade cannot be a goal in itself. Trade must support better, greener, and more inclusive economic model. At Europe Jacques Delors, our greening trade series, already counting eight papers, aims to translate this vision into reality. To make this happen, we need trade policies that connect sustainable production with sustainable consumption and promote a broader shift that helps consumer, consumers make better choices, policies that promote innovative solutions and cut barriers for trade in sustainable goods and services. Global trade governance must evolve and become a true ally of multilateral efforts to protect the environment, including the, the Paris Agreement. The global trading system must also actively contribute to eliminating environmentally harmful practices such as fossil fuel and fishery subsidies. At EU level, the trade policy review that the European Commission issued in February 2021 is a step in the right direction. It makes sustainability an explicit and central pillar of EU trade policy. Since then, legislative work around trade and sustainability matters has been intense. With the EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism proposal, the the due diligence proposal, the deforestation proposal, and the forthcoming commission review of sustainable development in free trade agreements, 2022 will be a decisive year to embed EU trade in a more sustainable model. Looking forward, what do we, what do we need what more do we need to reach our, our, our goal? It will require coordinated efforts from all sides, the public sector, the, pub, the private sector, and changes in consumer habits. At the same time, EU efforts to green its trade may be perceived as protectionism by trade partners, and the economic fallout of war in Ukraine Will, will hit the European Union hard, threatening EU's sustainability goals. That is why today's discussions particularly matters. Together, we want to discuss how to move one level up. Can sustainability be a goal in itself for EU trade policy? Pascal, it's your turn to, to say a few words about that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Geneviève, and thanks for bringing uh, to this uh, trade field uh, your experience and your long-standing commitment to uh, environment protection, uh, which, if I remember well, uh, really started when I uh, recruited you <laughs> as uh, environment advisor uh, of uh, Jacques Delors in the 90s. And I also remember that when we poached you uh, to take the responsibility of creating the third sister of the Institut Jacques Delors in Brussels after Paris and Berlin. You were at the time uh, the European uh, Policy Office head of the uh, WWF. So you know a bit about environment, I know a bit about trade, and this is the origin of this uh, series of uh, greening trade papers. Uh, which is a uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, backstage of uh, today's conversation. Uh, from the origin of the Common Market Treaty of Rome uh, to roughly uh, 20 years ago, i.e. during 50 years, uh, the main purpose of EU trade policy uh, was to help uh, EU producers to leverage uh, what economists call their comparative advantage on foreign markets by ensuring a fair level uh, playing field uh, for competition. There are things which Europeans do better than others. There are things which others do better than Europeans, hence the importance of uh, trading in order for Europeans to benefit from the know-how of the others and the other way around. This has led to a series of uh, policies and instruments uh, pushing for market access uh, with a bilateral or multilateral uh, trade agreement, the purpose of which is to reduce obstacles to trade, but also make sure with uh, trade defense instruments such as uh, anti-dumping uh, that uh, the competition uh, with foreign producers is uh, reasonably fair. This reasonably stable pattern has uh, started changing 20 years ago as uh, sustainability issues uh, entered into the field of EU trade policy. Sustainability understood mostly as environmental sustainability, uh, although uh, there may be uh, new elements in this concept of sustainability uh, which are appearing uh, little by little. And this, of course, has been accelerated uh, since 2019 uh, with uh, the Green Deal, which uh, has, in a way, created a new dynamic, a stronger willingness from the EU institutions to introduce to sustainability at the heart of EU uh, trade policy. Hence, the two uh, big questions uh, for uh, this discussion uh, today. Uh, number one, how much has uh, EU trade policy reformed itself so far in order to address these uh, sustainability issues? That's question number one. Uh, question number two, what does this mean uh, for uh, the main stakeholders of EU trade policy, starting, of course, with business? but also with a civil society organization who have gained, thanks to their attention to environmental sustainability for a long time, who have gained a new position in the uh, political spectrum uh, that determines uh, the uh, authorizing environment of trade policy. So those are the two questions uh, for uh, this morning. Uh, as you said, Geneviève, uh, we have a fantastic panel that is composed by the main uh, stakeholders. Uh, let me, before uh, turning to you, uh, repeat that uh, there will be questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so those of you who want to raise questions, uh, please uh, do this. Uh, we have the sort of normal uh, chat uh, functions, uh, and uh, we will try and make sure uh, at the end of the first part of the conversation that you can raise your own questions. Over to you, uh, Geneviève. Thank you very much, Pascal. And so uh, it will be my privilege to ask the first questions to, uh, to you, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, uh, Valdis uh, 
Okay, uh, it will be uh, so for you in a context where uh, climate policy trigger industrial transformation, impact uh, comparative advantages and uh, trade flows. What role uh, can the EU play uh, with its trade policy in helping to achieve uh, net zero by 2050? So to you, Mr. Vice President. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much. And first of all, I would like to thank Europe Jacques Delors for organizing this uh, timely and important uh, webinar. Uh, because it's true with uh, a European Green Deal in place, uh, every policy uh, must contribute to our climate and uh, sustainability uh, goals, including uh, trade. Uh, this is why our trade policy strategy we launched a year ago is the greenest uh, ever trade strategy we uh, had. Uh, uh, trade can support global transition to a low carbon uh, economy uh, in full alignment with European Green uh, Deal. Uh, our network of global trade deals uh, provides a platform to expand markets and spur innovation in climate friendly technologies and uh, services. Uh, this can help uh, to uh, create jobs and low, uh, lower emission levels all over the uh, world because trade, uh, trade agreements eliminate barriers and make green goods uh, more uh, affordable. And our trade uh, deals also provide leverage to work with our uh, partners to encourage them more uh, climate friendly uh, policies. Uh, uh, this is uh, vital because the EU cannot achieve sustainability and uh, climate uh, action alone, as EU uh, 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 contributes only around 9% of the global uh, emissions. So uh, remi remaining uh, committed to open, fair and rules-based trade is therefore an effective way to make these uh, changes uh, happen. And there, the strength of EU market uh, matters. Uh, uh, what we consume in Europe, the way we produce our green technology and innovation can make a crucial uh, uh, influence on trade and uh, on our trade and investment uh, partners. Uh, uh, as you know, our new trade uh, policy strategy is based on open strategic autonomy. Uh, this means that we remain committed to openness as the best way to achieve results while we uh, are more assertive in protecting our interests and values where uh, necessary. Uh, diversifying supply chains is uh, uh, in uh, a number of uh, key areas is uh, crucial uh, because it uh, will uh, allow to diversify EU trade flows and make our economy more uh, resilient. And when it comes to uh, energy and uh, climate friendly uh, goods and services, Massive investments in the EU and uh, partner countries are needed in order to develop and produce uh, uh, low carbon uh, hydrogen, uh, renewables, uh, advanced uh, uh, electromobility, energy efficient technologies, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so we also need to look at opening new markets for import and export of these environmental goods and also raw uh, materials, because a green economy requires different set of raw materials as uh, 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 carbon intensive uh, 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 economy, and we need to avoid trade barriers in this. So. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, this uh, are. Um, uh, uh, the main uh, elements there, and I wanted to go uh, uh, briefly through uh, actions which we are taking on uh, multilateral, uh, plurilateral, bilateral, and also autonomous uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, 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 in, in this context, to start with a multilateral and plurilateral uh, dimension, the EU co-sponsored three plurilateral WTO initiatives in December last year on trade and environmental sustainability, on plastic uh, pollution and sustainable plastic trade and on the reform of fossil fuel uh, subsidies. Uh, I have also recently initiated the idea of Trade Ministers Coalition for Climate to provide uh, uh, leadership in particularly in a WTO uh, uh, context. And we'll work with partners to uh, uh, kick off this coalition later this uh, year. And in parallel, it will be crucial to have meaningful uh, engagement and dialogue with business and civil society. 
on a bilateral uh, uh, dimension. Uh, we have two dimensions or so they mentioned the question of liberalization of green goods and services and removal of non-tariff uh, barriers and we also have trade and sustainable development uh, chapters uh, respect of the paris agreement will be uh, essential element in future trade and investment agreements and in addition we require g20 partners to commit to net zero uh, emissions for concluding uh, trade agreements uh, uh, with them uh, and I'm grateful for uh, the input we received from Client Airs and Jack Delors Institute for the review of trade and sustainable development uh, chapters in our uh, free trade uh, agreements. So our bilateral uh, trade deals provide essential platform to engage with our uh, partners on all climate and sustainability issues and also on transition on uh, sustainable food systems. So uh, uh, in this context, free trade agreements can uh, play a, a key role along with actions which must be taken in international fora and through regulatory measures taken in the EU. And finally, on autonomous uh, dimension, we continue to look at autonomous uh, measures to help ensure supply chains are sustainable, responsible and coherent with our overall objectives and uh, values. Uh, by, by, by the end of this uh, Commission's mandate, we are on track to have most ambitious set of measures in place to promote uh, sustainability across our uh, policies. So uh, uh, to give some examples, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is one of the Commission's flagship uh, initiatives. We have also adopted a proposal on deforestation-free products in EU markets and also on uh, sustainability corporate due diligence. We are also working on uh, market bans uh, 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 for products uh, forced, uh, produced with forced uh, labor. Uh, of course, all uh, these uh, measures, autonomous measures, which we are uh, designing, uh, must be designed in full respect of WTO uh, rules, notably the principle of non-discrimination and proportionality and avoiding unnecessary disruption of uh, trade. And we are uh, obviously aware that uh, autonomous measures require adaptation effort from our economic operators, but also from uh, uh, those in our partner uh, countries. This is why we should stand ready to have more cooperation and dialogue with them on those uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Commissioner. Now, uh, Pascal, it's your turn to... <coughs> Thanks, Geneviève. Uh, so my question is for Bernd Langer who chaired uh, the International Trade Committee at the European Parliament uh, and who's a good friend. We've been uh, working together for many, many years now. So Bernd, uh, it's, I think, uh, pretty clear that the EU Parliament has been one of the driving forces in order to make sure that sustainability is factored in the EU trade policy. Uh, this implies uh, a complex articulation uh, between uh, bilateral agreements, uh, multilateral agreements, autonomous measures, and given the constitutional power of the EU Parliament in uh, the EU institutions, all these measures have to go through the European Parliament, and first and foremost through your, your committee. So how do you see this complex articulation between bilateral, multilateral, and sort of unilateral measures, Bernd? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and I'm also happy to be here in this discussion because it's really important after this uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, this little bit, let's say, turn of era. And it's a little bit based regarding this Russian aggression, but even before, on the multilateral front, I'm not sure, Pascal, that your vision of open and free trade based on the rule of law, based on norm, is still the majority uh, position regarding trade. I see a lot of weaponizing trade, like China. I see a lot of protective measures also from some developing countries. I see 
the theory of managed trade from the United States. And uh, a lot of discussion now is going on about uh, friend shoring of uh, uh, supply chain. So it seems to be that this multilateral system is more or less not the vision uh, uh, which is uh, really based uh, on a significant uh, 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 amount of, of, of countries worldwide. And now Russia, I guess, is out of WTO. And my feeling is that some countries are all thinking that perhaps China should also go out because they are not related and uh, based on the norms. So uh, this disruption of the multilateral system uh, seems for me uh, that uh, the bilateral front and the autonomous front is perhaps at the moment the more important. And Valdis mentioned quite clearly uh, the umbrella of different measures uh, we are going um, forward. Um, and yes, uh, Pascal, you're quite right. The European Parliament pushed for making trade greener. And uh, I was quite happy to see the trade policy review where uh, a lot of these elements are integrated. And now let's see what will happen in the next years until the legislative firm will uh, stop. And really looking now um, to the bilateral front, I guess we will have four additional trade agreements with uh, Mexico, Chile, New Zealand and Australia. And there are also some elements where we can really improve our focus on uh, the, uh, the, the climate change and, and, and the, the green deal. So um, we need, uh, um, there's a big demand on, on green hydrogen, no doubt about. This uh, will change the trade structure for energy related uh, goods uh, and products uh, dramatically. And in the negotiation with Chile and with Australia, of course, the um, production of green hydrogen will play a role for the demand of the European Union, but also for the development of uh, a different kind of energy consumption in Australia and in Chile. So there is a bilateral possibility to strengthen uh, the um, environmental dimension uh, based on trade relations. And uh, um, therefore, I guess we should really try to use our bilateral strength there. Of course, we have some other bilateral uh, agreements where we can use this as well. So it's Canada, uh, no doubt about. And then we, yeah, and, and even on, on, on the relation with the United States, um, uh, while this uh, was present, we had a discussion in uh, my committee discussing the TTC. And uh, there was a question from my colleagues, what about uh, the green dimension in the TTC? Because a little bit, this was not on the top of the agenda in the discussion with the United States. We had, of course, related to the Russian aggression, the question of export restriction, the question of control of investment, the investment screening, cooperation, the data cooperation, and so on. But the question of greening trade was not the main topic. So we have to be careful that this TTC is not going in the direction of, let's say, uh, creating a new block in this global uh, field where this multilateral system is not really uh, the uh, uh, most liked uh, option. So this bilateral relation has to be also, I guess, a little bit more fo focused on uh, the uh, greening of our relation. And then the autonomous measures as well, while this men uh, mentioned, there are a lot on, on uh, in the basket uh, for this year. And I appreciate very much the due diligence uh, legislation at least is now on the table, which will lead to more risk uh, approach uh, management of environmental standards in the whole supply chain. We have uh, the deforestation legislation. I guess we will look a little bit on the products, perhaps 
extend uh, the uh, amount of products from this uh, six to another one and also look a little bit on the possibility for the monitoring process. But this has to go to the uh, parliament as well. And uh, then we have uh, the more defensive measures, which have also an impact regarding our policy for the Green Deal, like the anti-corruption instrument. We want to use this also to defend our approach to strengthen um, green uh, policy. So um, this, I guess, uh, is the, um, the uh, uh, attitude of the parliament regarding the next year. So unfortunately, I'm perhaps sometimes the last defender of the multilateral system, but it seems to be not likely that this is working um, quite well in the next years. Thanks, Bernd, uh, and thanks for making this point that uh, sustainability is not the only change uh, that is affecting uh, EU trade uh, policy. Uh, we've seen with uh, COVID, uh, we are seeing uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine that uh, other issues come up as far as international trade is concerned, uh, such as the resilience uh, or the security of uh, supply. And we probably will come back to that later in the discussion, uh, insofar as uh, these uh, new preoccupations may enter into some sort of tension with sustainability, uh, as we probably are already saying in the case of uh, food. Uh, Geneviève, uh, over to you for the next question. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, so, Jim, it will be your turn. And uh, I start by a few words concerning uh, Client Earth. Uh, client, uh, client Earth has a foot both in the public and private sectors. On the one hand, <laughs> it helps government to write environmental laws and regulators to enforce them. On the other, Client Earth sues polluting companies and helps them change their business model to improve their practices in the future. In such a position, which is a very uh, original and privileged one, what actions do you expect, do you expect from the business sector and uh, EU policy to better incorporate sustainability in international trade. <clears throat> Thank you, jean uh, for having me here today and for, for that introduction. Uh, people often focus uh, only on the, the, the lawsuits we bring uh, against uh, companies or countries. Uh, and uh, few people actually see that we bring those for a very positive reason, uh, as well as uh, uh, helping uh, countries, parliaments, right, right uh, legislation. Well, uh, I, I want to mention, uh, I agree certainly with, with Ben, uh, well, with all the previous speakers on um, uh, the, the value of the bilateral and autonomous uh, steps the EU can be making now. And we very much welcome the uh, trade reform that the EU is undertaking, particularly in uh, the deforestation and due diligence uh, proposals. I think these <clears throat> show the ability of the EU to legislate creatively as indeed the uh, digital markets proposal, uh, the Digital Markets Act last week, to legislate creatively in a way that will drive behavior uh, around the world far beyond the EU's borders. So <clears throat> uh, I think uh, as a principle, uh, we should be looking uh, to make the uh, global environmental protection a chief aim of trade policy in the EU and think of trade policy as a Green Deal plus so Green Deal is uh, within the EU borders. Uh, trade policy, because of its tremendous power, uh, can be seen as a Green Deal plus to take these uh, the very important ideas and to globalize them, even if it's through bilateral and autonomous action. Then to make it work, uh, four points uh, I'd like to, to mention. Uh, one is that placing all products on the EU market should be subject to sustainability criteria in time. Uh, and uh, we could start uh, with the uh, forests, uh, uh, the deforestation proposal uh, by uh, increasing the scope of the products covered to ones that uh, not only impact forests, but also would impact uh, other key ecosystems like savannas, 
oceans uh, and so on. Uh, so to broaden the scope of that, uh, um, deforestation uh, proposal, but then also to go beyond that uh, and have other sectoral legislation that would uh, uh, touch all, ultimately all products coming on the market. Second, um, the trade agreements should uh, incorporate substantive uh, environmental requirements, uh, not just require, <clears throat> as sometimes happens now, best endeavors. Best endeavors is a uh, Although uh, a good idea, uh, very vague, and will be very, it's very difficult uh, to to enforce. So, uh, substantive environmental requirements, which can in many cases be derived from existing multilateral uh, environmental agreements. Uh, third, uh, we need to move away from the strict investor protection mechanisms of the uh, ISDS uh, to more environmentally friendly and more democratic governance uh, systems. Uh, for, for trade, uh, in trade agreements uh, that provide greater transparency <clears throat> uh, and allow stakeholders uh, to participate. And finally, for, for companies, um, what, uh, what we need to be looking at is uh, sustainability across uh, the entire value chains of companies. So that means uh, when it comes to climate, um, Paris compliant business plans, um, as everyone on the call will know, the Paris Agreement doesn't touch companies directly. So it's vital that we look for mechanisms to require uh, Paris compliant business plans from companies that touch scopes one, two, and three of emissions. And then also to have uh, parallel reasoning uh, and parallel requirements for sustainability uh, on, on biodiversity. So essentially, you could think of scope one, scope two, and scope three uh, um, impacts on biodiversity <clears throat> and use that as a, as a metric, uh, uh, intellectual metric for setting sustainability across the value chains of companies. Finally, on companies, uh, we need to be very um, alert to uh, the possibilities of greenwashing and not just possibilities. Uh, but to the practice of greenwashing, uh, I may get to it later, but uh, or in questions. But we've just sued uh, Total Energy uh, in France um, under French <clears throat> consumer law on the on behalf of French consumers uh, because of uh, clear misstatements uh, of uh, of its own uh, actions with respect to climate mitigation. So, uh, looking for ways to prevent greenwashing and to set up barriers against greenwashing also very important. And trade offers an opportunity to do that. <clears throat> Pascal, your turn. Mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, next question for Lucy. Uh, Lucy Parker. Uh, you're known, Lucy, as a, a big uh, promoter of uh, ESG in uh, business practices. You basically believe that uh, big business can fix the world. This is your own word, the one that belongs to the title of your uh, well-known book. And uh, you've also been a big force uh, in engaging uh, Brunswick, uh, this uh, big worldwide uh, consultancy uh, in uh, ESG uh, matters. So my question for you, uh, Lucy, is uh, how do you see uh, the dynamics at play, the one we've been discussing so far. How do you see this uh, uh, involving on the business side? Over to you, Lucy. Uh, thank you. And uh, as others have said, I'm delighted to be part of the conversation. And uh, James, to pick up from what you're saying, because uh, I was so delighted to hear the things that had been rolling in my mind ab about how business responds in the way you were talking about how trade policy can help it happen. Um, as you say, Pascal, uh, I'm a promoter of the idea that business needs to be part of the solution. It is often thought to be only part of the problem, and yet uh, the things we're trying to achieve cannot be achieved without business becoming part of the solution. So the question is how, how, to, how to push, how to help, how to advocate for, how to make it possible that that's the case. Um, and I think that one of the things that's really hitting business today is the degree to which now, if you're leading a business, you are expected to deliver on these environmental factors. That was not true even a decade ago. It was not true 
even five years ago to the degree it is today. So also what we're looking at, of course, is a lot of people uh, governing big businesses today in all kinds of leadership roles were not actually trained into those roles and developed into those roles with the expectation that responding to environmental matters was on their to-do list, was part of their responsibility. So what you're seeing is a huge gear change in business. And the question is, how fast can we help them accelerate that? So I think that there are three things that I'm seeing inside businesses. Are there real opportunity and their real challenge? And, and I know uh, when we were speaking earlier, those often look like two different questions. To me, they seem like different sides of the same coin. The challenge is the opportunity. The first, of course, is innovation. Um, almost everything you're seeing today that is breakthrough in any way comes from the capacity to innovate. That's sometimes technological innovation, but very often it's innovation in processes. It's a commitment to innovation. And what that actually means is that it has to be there from design from the outset. This is not a question of measuring damage subsequently. It's about designing into your innovation that it will be more environmentally sustainable. That is a big challenge for business to do that. On the other hand, it's their greatest opportunity. Purchasing, we've talked about. Uh, the language is supply chains, but it seems to me there's two faces where we can help influence the purchasing power of business. One is obviously the shaping of supply chains. Almost all of the sophisticated companies, all of the leaders in ESG are, of course, driving their change through their value chains, the entirety of their value chains. And anything that uh, the, the regulations can do and trade agreements to, can do to reinforce that, as James says, is a very big win. But another piece of that is, of course, what I'm finding myself increasingly calling activist coalitions. If you look at the energy that's generated around something like sustainable aviation fuel, you're bringing different parties to the same story, each with their part in the, in, the, in the operation. Those are some of the most creative spaces for business to act today, because no company can do it alone, not even one sector can do it alone, this kind of change. And then finally, ratcheting it up. The ratcheting up is massively important. All of the great leaders today in sustainable value chains have found that their value chains were not ready. They couldn't do it. And so you've got to give them a roadmap to ratchet it up. And that creates uh, qu quite a challenge. It actually means the capacity inside business has to learn to build its own supply chain in an active way, in a way it's never done before. And then when you look at positively innovative pilots, things where ideas are started, possibilities are created, suddenly it then has to move to implementation. And the rolling out of innovative pilots is another challenge and opportunity for business. So it strikes me that all of those things are both the opportunity and the big challenge. But really the biggest thing that I think is happening and needs to happen is systemic change. If you look at the people who are leading the way in this in the corporate arena, they're all not only governed by their own performance. They're part and parcel of driving systemic change, as James was saying. So to me, that is the opportunity. And, um, and I think this conversation about where trade fits in <coughs> is, is enormously important because as you would expect, um, companies are, are, are finding it very difficult. There is a blizzard of regulation coming at them. And the big globals are finding that because everything is different in every geography, that multiplies the problem. So anything that can be done for consistency, for coherence, for it not being yet another thing that has to be coped with. So the, the comprehensiveness, the coherence of the policies coming at them really matter. But I wonder whether there's a thing just to leave with us on this front that could be almost um, exploited. I think Andrew was talking about the opportunity to be in dialogue with the corporates, with the stakeholders. And I was reflecting that there, it's almost as if there's a parallel check at the moment happening in the trade uh, arena and to the corporate arena. Is there any merit that they're not just um, parallel lines, that they're intersecting lines? Let me give you three quick examples. I was very struck by the conversation about the sustainability impact assessments and don't they need to be 
clarified before the trade deal is signed. Now, this is really something that struck me as having a great parallel in the corporate arena. So if you took leaders in the space like Nike in America, what did they do when they really leapt forward in innovation? They brought together their sustainability and innovation departments, which is akin to the thought about design and innovation. How is it absolutely certain that the sustainability impact assessment is baked in before the thing is signed off? Otherwise, you're in the historic corporate paradigm of measuring harm subsequently. Secondly, ratcheting up mechanisms. So many countries in the world can't get there. They can't do it fast enough. But the corporates have got very sophisticated at creating ratcheting up mechanisms. Is there a way of that becoming more part of a shared dialogue? And finally, of course, words to commitment. One of the biggest things that's happened in the last five years is that companies are being held to account, now increasingly by investors, for turning those words into action. And um, it is only words, but actually the words can be delivered in such a way that you can track them, report them, measure them, and make them more transparent. So words into action, a, a firmer language, but also transparency about people being held to it. Those are things that seem to be part of the trade journey, and they're certainly part of the corporate journey. Could they be more the dialogue between the corporates and the policymakers in trade? Thank you very much, uh, Lucy. And now we will start our second round of questions to every panelist. And I will start with you. You have already given us uh, the keys of the transformation of uh, business. Uh, a lot of them, uh, at least, and very interesting. Thank you so much for that. And now, could you give us some examples of successful firms aligning their business goals with ecological and social ones? Yes, um, there are some really fantastic uh, examples of this. Um, and I think that it's the nature of the example that is important, meaning I don't know any major listed companies now that don't put ecological and social goals into their mix. The real question is, how fast, how far, how much is word turned to action? They all have them. It's the point that was being made earlier. To, to who is going fast enough and far enough? And that comes back to the stories that I was talking about before, the issues that I was talking about before. I mean, I think one of the extraordinary players in this space, of course, is Maersk. Um, and one of the reasons is, you know, some years ago, they asked themselves the question, could we innovate for a really radical drop in, um, in emissions? And they surprised themselves even by the scale of it. And it led them to produce the largest and lightest and most ecologically friendly vessel on the planet. And actually recently they've said again, we need green fuel. And they've put into the process the um, development of, of eight ships that will actually run on, on carbon-free fuel. So this ability to innovate moves the story forward. So anything that can be done to encourage that form of innovation really matters. Um, Tetra Pak is interesting, I think, when you look at ecosystems on, on uh, waste. If you are a carbon producer, you're very challenged by the regulations today, um, and, and properly so, and the company recognizes that. But actually, if you are a company, any company in this space, uh, you, of course, don't control that ecosystem. So what you're really seeing is companies moving into action to work across their ecosystem to create change way beyond the possibility of what they control. And that can be done. And you can see it in a shift in policy throughout the re recycling ecosystem in, in that company. Now, you can see it in lots of others, but that's a very interesting one. I mentioned an American company for my third example, because um, I think this thing of driving through value chains is very important. Um, and I think what Walmart's done on Project Gigaton is extremely important, because that's a scale of um, ambition on both oceans and land um, and pollinators. And, and the way they're operating it, of course, is through their value chain. But the expectations on the value chain for transparency and commitments within the next five years is 
really a scale move. So to me, the biggest test is, are those, are those uh, commitments being led to action? And is the action to scale commensurate with the scale of the company in the system? And all of the games you see, which is really uh, people playing at the front edge, people who are leading the game, they're using their innovative power, their purchasing power, and their ecosystem power to drive change way beyond their own affairs. And that's what we should be expecting leaders to do. Thank you very much, Lucy. Pascal. Pascal, you're on mute. My next question is for uh, James. Uh, uh, you've told us, James, that uh, client earth is uh, on the one side uh, debunking uh, greenwashing, and that's the sort of activist part of what you're doing. But on the other side, also uh, trying to advise uh, governments, uh, policymakers, regulators, so that they adopt uh, the right tools in order uh, to include more sustainability in their activities. So my, my question to you, uh, James, is about due diligence, uh, which is a sort of uh, a new avenue, uh, the purpose of which is uh, to put the legal responsibility of uh, ESG, uh, whether it's environment, whether it's uh, social, whether it's uh, human rights, whether it's health, into companies. So how do you see uh, the role of due diligence and what is your advice uh, to policymakers uh, uh, relevant to this tool? Yep, thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Um, I, I want to pick up uh, first the theme that uh, Lucy and uh, others mentioned earlier of uh, companies needing to be um, uh, moving ahead uh, and moving ahead as, as quickly as possible. I, I have a, a simple model in my own mind, which is I imagine a capitalist road leading towards a, an ecological civilization. And uh, uh, because we'll only get to the ecological civilization if companies actually deliver it. Uh, and then you have companies straying off on one side um, into very unsustainable activities, uh, oil companies, for example. Uh, and then the idea uh, that we've been uh, pursuing is to use fiduciary duty uh, to move companies back onto that road. So the duty to act responsibly. Uh, and we've been working with shareholders. So part of this is also working as a stakeholder group with shareholders who are involved in a suit against Shell uh, to require uh, on the on part of shareholders a, uh, a, a, a sustainable management of the business. On the other side of the road, the companies will stray off who aren't as responsible as they should be uh, into, into greenwashing. So then you can have greenwashing legislation and cases to push them uh, back on the road. But uh, in uh, the, uh, overall, what you want to be able to do, and as regulators, what you want to be able to do is to help companies to prevent and then mitigate uh, their um, impacts um, through the regulations you, uh, you make. And so three points on that. One is that uh, with respect to due diligence, it's uh, so due diligence is a type of study. Uh, and if you think of a company enlightening itself uh, as to how to become one of those good companies, uh, on the, the road to a building ecological civilization, that study of their own impacts is, is the first step. You know, Socrates had the idea that to know the good is to do the good. I don't know if he was entirely right, but it's, an, it's certainly clear that unless you know the good, you can't do the good. So due diligence is all about knowing the good uh, and by studying the activities uh, that, that you uh, that you undertake as a company. Now, here, uh, what you want is to make sure that the impacts that are required to be studied um, are the right impacts. Um, and that's that becomes very crucial. Uh, so are we requiring the companies to look at the right things? Here, I, I would suggest that the, the current due diligence proposal is, is a bit narrow by excluding climate change. Um, the uh, climate change is front and center, and it would have been a uh, a, a terrific place to require companies to uh, do the scope one, scope two, scope three uh, analysis um, uh, for uh, in their due diligence requirements. I know there's a future proposal, um, but a future proposal is is in is in the future, and there too the um, it, it appears that the scope of the group of companies uh, that would be subject to that is is a bit narrow in that they're very large companies. 
so 159 euros or more. Certainly those companies should be required to do the due diligence on climate, but query whether we can't push that down to, uh, to smaller companies who uh, produce much of the impact and uh, they should be required to study themselves as well. Um, and uh, then to, uh, as I say, to make the due diligence really meaningful, it should, uh, it should look at the Green Deal if you want to, uh, if you want to use the due diligence requirement to push the Green Deal forward, uh, which is, of course, what we all want, then you should be including climate now and those scope one, scope two, scope three requirements. And, and when it comes to biodiversity, a similar requirement, essentially scope one, two, three uh, on the biodiversity impacts. So that was my first point on making it work. Uh, second point on making due diligence uh, uh, effective uh, across the board, and this goes back to Pascal's point, uh, is to add uh, the impacts uh, to vulnerable people. So uh, what are the impacts to vulnerable communities that are affected by elements of the supply chain? And here I think uh, of the uh, of land rights of forest dependent communities. So uh, a vast number of uh, human beings dependent on forests uh, and uh, how are their rights affected by the activities of uh, the people in scope to well, any of the scopes uh, in the supply chain? Uh, uh, let's study that. And finally, uh, third point is uh, to make the enforcement work. How to make enforcement work? Um, well, if we leave uh, enforcement of the due diligence requirements entirely to the member states, um, I think we'll see spotty results as we have with the uh, the EU timber regulation, a good example, and a good re regulation, but enforcement uh, has been has been spotty. So um, I would suggest that, uh, to give uh, stakeholders, citizens, uh, the right to enforce in a systemic way, uh, and the way you would set that up would be to make the duties clear. So they're very clear duties. So there's not much disagreement uh, argument about them. That will help the companies. It will help the stakeholders. Second, that information about compliance um, should be transparent, should be publicly available uh, and accessible by civil society uh, and indeed by other companies. Uh, it, uh, you would want companies to be able to make sure that their competitors uh, were acting appropriately. So that should be transparent information and then access uh, to justice for, for the stakeholders. We've had a lot of success in uh, under the um, air quality directive in working in 20 member countries now, uh, member states, to enforce that directive. And as I mentioned, we've sued Total in France under the um, uh, uh, under consumer law, and uh, we're involved in a shareholder suit under shareholder legislation uh, against uh, Shell. But those are all uh, looking for opportunities within the existing system uh, for ways of directing companies uh, to do better. Uh, if you start from the beginning, uh, and it's rather like Lucy's idea about um, innovation, if you're innovating the system, uh, what elements do you want to put in uh, in order to make the due diligence system both effective and then uh, enforceable? And I, I would, I would uh, suggest that it's that requirement of clarity, transparency, and access to, to justice uh, broadly speaking. And what you're trying to do is to build the rule of law for the environment uh, through uh, in these trade instruments. Uh, and by making due diligence effective by giving the broad, uh, broad stakeholders the, the right to enforce, you're, you're putting a lot more eyes on the ground. And as, as we know, um, uh, the more eyes on the ground, um, the more honesty uh, that tends to uh, ensue. So uh, uh, I, would, I would recommend those points in terms of making due diligence effective. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. So now uh, it's my turn to come to you, uh, Bernd. And uh, exactly one month ago, a delegation of five members of the INTA committee traveled to Mexico to hold talks on the prospects of the modernized EU-Mexico agreement and other issues on the bilateral economic and trade agenda. How can FTAs further support and provide incentives to sustainable development when it comes to respect for human rights, labor rights, and environment? Is there still room for improvement in the level of ambition 
of environmental and social clauses that the EU can negotiate with its trade partners in FTAs. So Bernd, it's your turn. So the easy answer would be yes, there is room for improvement, but I guess you expect a little bit more. Um, so yes, I was in Mexico and uh, I chaired the delegation and we discussed uh, the modernization of the trade agreement. We have, of course, some additional elements compared to the agreement from 2000 are in. And um, one lesson learned is, of course, that the trade partner have to be able to fulfill, fulfill the obligation. Um, and uh, therefore, I guess it's totally clear that uh, this is not a one-way street. Uh, sustainability has to be really developed in partnership. That's perhaps also a difference to other trading partner, uh, which are using their economic power to dominate uh, perhaps some trade uh, agreements. So in the case of Mexico, of course, we have to be clear that uh, the obligations we uh, are, uh, really uh, think are important for sustainability on both sides of the Atlantic are able to be realized. And uh, therefore some improvements are necessary. So first the question of a pre-ratification condition. So, so um, normally we say the uh, environmental uh, convention from the UN, the core ILO conventions and the Paris Climate Agreement should be um, signed and uh, that's a precondition. Perhaps that's, that's not sufficient because I know of course a lot of countries have signed more or less all ILO convention, but in reality, uh, they are not um, giving a paradise for, for workers. So, so it's not just the formal ratification of a convention, which uh, is uh, demonstrating that the content is really implemented. So the precondition for uh, ratification and in, let's say in, in um, exercise to analyze in the sustainability world, we should do similar, we uh, uh, do it in uh, the economic world. I remember quite well, when we started the negotiation the trade agreements with Japan, we made a list, I guess it was around about 20 points uh, regarding the implementation of international standards for the cars, for the dealership and whatever. So on the uh, economic side, we made such a pre-negotiation, uh, uh, pre-condition exercise, but not on the sustainability side. So this has to be changed, I guess. Secondly, on the implementation, I guess it's totally clear, not beginning from, start, uh, from, from day one, everything will be fixed. So we need a proper roadmap for the implementation with clear, milestone when what can be achieved. And this, of course, needs also a clear commitment for support if there is a big economic power and a developing country or a small economic power so that the possibilities are really uh, balanced. And uh, uh, this, is, I guess, also a core element of, of the EU trade policy that we are really looking for um, support uh, in, in, in this uh, area as well. So uh, a roadmap with clear milestones for the implementation. By the way, uh, the European Parliament and myself negotiated this, such a roadmap with Vietnam, uh, with the Vietnamese government, so that we can really uh, see when what is achieved. Thirdly, um, the question of monitoring. Um, so this is also a little bit linked also to the due diligence. I guess we should really uh, look a bit more how to how we can guarantee a proper monitoring process. Um, two elements. So the role of civil society has to be strengthened. We have quite unique, by the way, the domestic advisory groups. Um, installed in our bilateral trade agreements. It's a really a unique uh, exercise. Um, and uh, uh, we got really a, a good um, um, 
view about uh, the, the situation on the ground, but I guess there's a lot of possibilities to improve the work of uh, domestic advisory groups. Also give them more rights to act, uh, to uh, start uh, um, uh, um, government consultation uh, or the, the uh, ruling of the panel for experts if there is a violation on environmental or climate change or labor rights. So the role of civil society should be strengthened in our future uh, bilateral trade agreements. And the role of the EU delegation should be reflected for that as well. So where a um, uh, victim of a violation uh, could really make his or her case. So the role of the EU delegation should be also in focus. And then uh, how to use the uh, digital world. Um, this is also, by, by the way, important for the Jujilians, I guess. We should really try to develop artificial intelligence so that we can score companies, score um, countries on a really uh, in-time uh, perspective. So AI is really crucial for that. And also blockchain technology to have full transparency for the uh, supply chain. So uh, these uh, instruments should be developed also um, from, from our side. And fourthly, the question uh, of enforcement. Huh? So um, we discussed it also for a long time, but I guess it's totally clear and I'm quite happy that now the commission also reflecting sanctions as a last resort uh, if uh, the obligations are not fulfilled. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, we have different uh, way to go uh, compared to the United States. Just, uh, uh, having the stick in the hand, that's that was our uh, way to have a proper development. Uh, but if at the end of the day of, uh, uh, regarding the escalation letter, there is no solution, then we have also the, the need uh, for uh, having um, compensation and sanctions uh, to uh, bring the partner countries in line with the obligation of agreement. So there is a development. By the way, this is, uh, uh, you can see also uh, uh, regarding the um, bilateral agreements for the next, last uh, 10 years. So there are always some um, uh, uh, more clarity, more uh, procedure uh, 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 development, also some new chapters. So with Chile, we are now negotiating on gender equality and uh, gender related aspects in the Mexico agreement. We have the anti-corruption uh, uh, chapter for the first time. So it's an evolution, it's not a revolution, but I'm quite convinced that uh, uh, um, until summer we are able to um, bring some further improvement in our uh, TSD chapter for the next uh, trade agreements. Thanks very much, Bernd. Uh, so we have uh, roughly 20 minutes uh, left. So I think it's time uh, to uh, look at the questions from the audience. Uh, as could be expected, uh, they are directed uh, first to uh, the vice president of the commission and then to you, <laughs> Bernd. Uh, but uh, there are also uh, issues which uh, where I believe uh, we need the input of uh, Lucy and uh, James. So uh, Geneviève uh, will take uh, questions for Lucy and James, but let me start uh, with a question that, uh, that appeared uh, already. There are two questions for uh, the vice president, uh, which are on specific uh, matters. One is about uh, when will the commission bring its uh, fourth labor? proposal. Uh, and the second question uh, for uh, Aldis Lomboskis is uh, what about this uh, initiative which you floated, uh, which is called uh, Trade Ministers for Climate? So that's two very uh, precise questions. And then there are two questions for both you, uh, Vice President, and uh, for the chair of the INTA committee. Uh, one coming from uh, 
a good old friend of mine, uh, which is uh, Franz Fischler, who uh, unsurprisingly uh, raises the question of whether there's any hope from the side of the commission or the parliament to revive the multilateral trading system. And the second one, uh, which is also for both of you, uh, and which is uh, key to our discussion uh, today, is whether you see sustainability prescriptions as a possible obstacle to new trade opening agreements. So if that's okay with you, uh, Vice President, uh, I will first give you the floor for your two specific questions and for these two more general, and then we will turn to uh, Bernd uh, for these questions. Uh, Valdis, uh, floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pascal. Uh, before going uh, into uh, uh, these uh, questions, I just wanted to note that I would appreciate the opportunity actually to uh, say a couple of words on the review of uh, TSD uh, chapters uh, as it Please was seen. <laughs> Uh, because it's, uh, I think it's very uh, uh, important for today's uh, discussion, and uh, uh, this work is ongoing right right now. So maybe I will quickly go through this and then come to the uh, questions you you raised. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, there is lots of uh, questions about uh, ongoing review of the TSD uh, chapters in our uh, free trade uh, agreements. Well, uh, first of all, it must be said that uh, already uh, now we have a broad and binding uh, TSD uh, uh, chapters in our free trade uh, agreements. We gave this approach a boost three years ago with our 15-point uh, TSD action plan. Uh, we are uh, strengthening enforcement, including through setting up a chief trade enforcement uh, officer but also putting in place uh, uh, award-winning, I would say, complaints uh, systems, a single entry uh, uh, point. Uh, and we have strengthened the cooperation with member states, European Parliament, international organizations on implementation of uh, 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 TSD. Uh, we have also provided some colleagues who they mentioned stronger role for civil uh, so society in uh, this um, uh, regards. So now, uh, 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 moving to the uh, TSD review process, which we launched last uh, year. We are already in fairly advanced uh, stages. We had open public consultation. We published results in January. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Jardelor Institute and Client Airs for your constructive contributions to this uh, consultation. And I think this event is also very useful in uh, this regard. Uh, we had comparative study about how our trade uh, uh, partners deal with the implementation and enforcement of trade and sustainability uh, provisions in their agreements. So maybe on some things which are shaping up. Uh, one important principle is that uh, there is no one size fits all uh, because uh, 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 clearly, we are dealing with very diverse set of uh, countries. We cannot uh, try to, you know, uh, apply the same uh, 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 rules and principles uh, to partners as diverse as New Zealand and Indonesia, with whom both we are now negotiating. Uh, so tailored uh, roadmaps may be a practical way to achieve those uh, uh, objectives, and uh, they may also then facilitate uh, monitoring of FTAs until they in, in, enter into force. Of course, for this, uh, still, I would say, cooperation and dialogue should remain watchwords for uh, TSDs. So uh, uh, with our uh, agreements serving as a platforms where we can jointly and continuously work on uh, improvements, um, well, then on enforcement, as I said, uh, our uh, TSDs are already uh, uh, enforceable. And this has been uh, proved, for example, in a pa panel uh, review in a case we brought uh, against uh, South Korea on their labor commitments in FTAs. Uh, but I know there are many uh, questions concerning sanctions in the framework of uh, uh, review. And uh, there, uh, I think we have to find appropriate uh, balance. Uh, so uh, if necessary, by focusing any sanctions on core provisions of the sustainable development uh, uh, chapter. Uh, so we are uh, currently uh, still uh, analyzing such uh, possible uh, provisions and uh, there we welcome the ongoing dialogue with, with member states, uh, European Parliament and civil society on uh, uh, this. 
so we need to uh, uh, reflect if it would be useful to apply sanctions based on our standard dispute settlement and as a matter of last uh, resource in case of blatant and persistent breaches of common baseline uh, of internationally agreed uh, standards. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, as I said, uh, basically we should remain centered on uh, cooperation and engagement, but seeing sanctions in uh, some uh, 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 circumstances as uh, as a uh, last uh, uh, resort. So uh, basically, our aim is to conclude the whole review exercise in the first half of the year, just also to give us a, a timeline. As probably briefer than I was intending to be, so that I can come uh, to the questions you raised, because there are a number of uh, questions. So uh, questions which are coming now from audience on uh, uh, forced labor product ban. Indeed, we are working on uh, this uh, initiative as it, as it was announced by the president von der Leyen. Uh, so uh, banning products made by forced labor from the single market. Uh, so we are currently already uh, uh, preparing uh, this um, initiative, which would cover both domestic and imported uh, products and combine a, a ban with a robust risk-based enforcement uh, framework, uh, building on international standards and uh, complementing existing horizontal and sectoral uh, uh, initiatives. And uh, in terms of timeline, in, indeed, uh, we are working towards adoption uh, after a summer. Uh, September is uh, the uh, uh, timing which we have in uh, mind. Well, it's not carved in stone. Uh, there may be sometimes, you know, some uh, slippage of uh, of uh, uh, of preparations, but uh, that's a timeline which we are having in mind. Uh, then uh, a question on the Trade uh, uh, Minister's Coalition for Climate. Indeed, we are preparing this uh, initiative. Uh, there, uh, one could say, I draw the inspiration with a uh, trade, uh, sorry, with a finance minister's coalition for climate, which is already there and successfully working and uh, looking on many aspects, including how uh, public finances can better contribute to sustainability aspects. And here uh, is a similar idea to how this coalition of finance ministers looking how trade policy can better uh, uh, prepare this, uh, uh, better uh, uh, improve uh, uh, the, the sustainability and achievement of climate uh, goals. So as I said, we are preparing this uh, launch event for later this uh, year. Uh, then uh, on the work of reviving multilateral trading system, well, that's very much brings us back to the question of the reform of the World Trade uh, Organization, where, you know, we have proposed a, a comprehensive uh, proposal for WTO reform, covering all three uh, core functions, uh, negotiation, monitoring and deliberation, and uh, dispute uh, settlement. Uh, what we are now trying to achieve uh, in a view of 12 ministerial conference, MC12, is to set up a WTO working group, which would start working on this issue with the aim to reach substantial outcomes by MC13. Uh, so that's what we are willing to uh, deliver, because I, I think there's no secret that WTO is in a, a crisis and reform is uh, urgently uh, necessary. And from the EU side, we are uh, committed to this and we are committed to ensuring that there is a continued multilateral rules-based trading system in the uh, world. Uh, then on the question uh, whether uh, the uh, sustainability uh, considerations can be an obstacle for um, negotiating and uh, ratifying new uh, free trade agreements. Well, there I would say it's a question of uh, finding the right uh, balance and uh, having this uh, approach of engagement with our uh, partners as a basis, because at the beginning, uh, some colleagues will be uh, notified that uh, if we are getting it wrong, it can be seen as a form of protectionism from the EU uh, side. So we need to be careful there to find the right uh, balance. And I think uh, the approach we set out in our new trade policy strategy is hopefully striking this balance. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for the precision of your answers, uh, ladies. Uh, Bernd, uh, over to you, and then uh, Geneviève uh, will pose questions uh, to Lucy and uh, James. 
Yeah, thanks a lot on the multilateral front. Um, of course, I support the European uh, uh, proposals, but uh, my fear is that at the end of the day, um, in a few years, we have a situation where we have this bipolar world uh, with Russia, China on the one hand, with uh, US and European Union on the other hand, and India is a little bit indifferent in between. Uh, and this is, of course, not totally in our interest because we are so uh, democracy first in uh, trade relation and we want to have, of course, global progress, specifically also regarding uh, the fight against climate change. So therefore, I guess we need really to try to um, engage in the main um, partners that they switch more to the multilateral front and gave more engagement. So we will have the uh, EU-China uh, summit on the 1st of April. So perhaps there can also some movement that this is not this block building uh, 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 street uh, uh, anymore. Uh, we will have talks with uh, India and also uh, 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 trying to, to give a little bit more engagement for the WTO and then of course, with the United States is really important. As Walter said, the modernization of WTO is necessary, but there we need really the US on board and they have to show, show more engagement uh, uh, as uh, uh, they show uh, so far. And the obstacle, I heard it since I'm in the parliament. Ah, uh, uh, sustainability is an obstacle. No, it's an it is, is an way to improve the living condition for the people on the ground. And my fear a little bit is that because of the Russian aggression and the turn of year we are now, everybody, a lot of people are saying, no, sustainable, forget it. It's more important to stabilize the economic system. And no, I think it's an integrated part of the game and we will go ahead as promised. Thank you very much. I, 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 I now come to Lucy and, and James for maybe the last question, no? Or, yes, we have, we have time, we have time. So, well, actually I have two, two questions for you, uh, each of you. First, <clears throat> what point uh, in other speakers' uh, 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 speeches, what point looks the most important to you? On which point would you like to come back? And, and second, um, with COVID and, and Ukraine uh, crisis, um, sustainability is at risk of uh, getting um, not sidelined, but uh, a bit forgotten. So what is your feeling about that and the way to react to that? So maybe Lucy first and then James. Thank you and, and thank you for the question. Um, there is so much to take away from this conversation, I think, um, that maybe I would, maybe I would make uh, two points, one very specific and one more for me, the mood and significance perhaps of the entire conversation. Um, I think this point, uh, Bernd, that you most made a moment ago, um, the need to keep the sustainability argument central to whatever the next uh, difficulties we will face as a world it is. Um, we will all have experienced in the corporate world, for example, a few years back, it was not many years back, minutes ago, it was how can we keep sustainability on the front when it's all to do with COVID. Um, even with the protests around the world, people said, well, now this is very urgent and we have to look at our workforces and we can't keep sustainability on the front. So I think the people for whom this is a concern and for whom the work is about driving forward the sustainability agenda, this constant insistence that it is not a trade-off between the two, it is that this is how you get to a secure energy. This is how you get to a, 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 a world where the, the greater balance and equity in the trade agreements is real. So for me, this keeping it on the front uh, of the agenda is, is the crucial thing. And it answers, I think, your second point, Olivia, which is what about Ukraine? Um, 
of course we can we can all see and, and, and fear the urgency of the Ukraine situation and and, and feel for the, the people affected by it. It surely has to be, to that last point, yet more reason to keep sustainability on the front, not a reason to take it to the back. So that would be my aim. It's not an obstacle, it's the way forward. And when I said I felt there was something about the mood, working in the corporate arena, I am so conscious that European regulation around sustainability is absolutely at the forefront of keeping corporates on this agenda. It is a hub in the world for progressive thinking on environment. And you can see it when you see corporates respond to regulation in other parts of the world. Um, the fact that Europe has it on the forefront of the agenda is a massive global asset. And so it's part of the reason I'm so pleased to have been part of this conversation and would cheer on and support from the sidelines anybody who is actually making that happen in your trade agreements. And like in the corporate arena, it won't happen if it's on the side. It has to happen through the trade agreement. If it's peripheral, it will never happen. It has to happen through the trade agreement. But that is a massive asset for the world to achieve. Thank you very much, Lucy. Good words of optimism and determination. James? I would, I would also uh, underline the, the importance of the EU in creating uh, these uh, global frameworks uh, in uh, driving forward uh, and uh, an intellectually exciting uh, and uh, politically uh, brave uh, way of looking at these issues. And I, uh, the EU, because it's the world's biggest market, uh, can uh, set the global agenda as we've seen many times. I, I have a long environmental career that extends back to California, back in the days when you know, California actually can pass stronger regulations on air quality than the rest of the United States. It's the biggest market in the United States. It's the fifth largest economy in the world. It decided it would pass 35 years ago, uh, legislation requiring car companies, uh, if they were gonna sell their cars in California to make 1% of them emission free. Uh, and because of that, and then the ratcheting up, uh, we have uh, wonderful technology for electric vehicles now. But it shows you what um, a very foresighted uh, large market uh, can do when it picks up the agenda and makes a, a beautifully thought out uh, regulation. So uh, I, I applaud the, uh, the ability of the EU to do this. With Ukraine, um, a tremendous human tragedy. Um, and at the same time, it won't be the last one. So this idea of staying focused uh, on the sustainability agenda to build the ecological civilization, very, very important. Um, uh, if we five years from now have uh, you know, a, a mass, um, say, uh, combination of uh, weather events that drives 5 million people, 10 million people to migrate, that will be the next crisis uh, due to climate change. So the sustainability agenda has to, we have to remain very fixed to it while various crises come and various crises pass, because it's not the last crisis that we're going to face. And um, I was very pleased to see uh, President von der Leyen's uh, statement that I thought this was a very creative EU move, saying that we, uh, we, we're going to see the Germans uh, build a, a floating uh, uh, liquid natural gas ports in the Baltic uh, so that they can take in more natural gas quickly. OK, a spike in natural gas use. But she said, uh, we're going to make sure that the technology um, is uh, then able to take in hydrogen as well. So that when we make the shift from liquid, uh, nit uh, liquid gas to uh, liquid nitrogen, nitrogen uh, the technology that we've put in place for this emergency will be useful. That's tremendously adaptive uh, thinking. So uh, an example of how you stay on focus when, when there's a crisis. And finally, I just make a point about China and the EU. We have a, a, a big China office. We work uh, with uh, the uh, much of the senior leadership. Uh, and the, um, I see the relationship between the EU and China on environment, where uh, both China and the EU want to achieve very, very forward-looking things. And China really does, as, as does the EU. That um, overlap in interest um, is one of the few sweet spots politically uh, in the world right now. So, um, so treasuring that ability of the EU, not only to think big, but cooperate 
uh, with, with China on environment, keeps doors open, keeps the ability to work together around the world uh, moving in a, in a very important way. So um, uh, you're all doing the angels work and uh, uh, at Client Earth, we wanna support you in any, in any possible way, whether it's drafting regulations, whether it's giving specific advice on whether this as opposed to that would allow enforcement to work very practical things. We'd be very, very happy to help. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, James, including for this uh, very concrete proposal uh, on how to how to follow up on this conversation. Uh, we are uh, nearing the end of this uh, discussion. And let me, uh, to finish, put the question which uh, Geneviève uh, just uh, put to both of you. Uh, to uh, Bernd Langer first and to uh, Vladis Dombrovskis to finish. Is there a risk, given uh, uh, the COVID shock, given the shock of the uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia, is there a risk that sustainability considerations, which, as we said, and we've developed that, really now matter in EU trade policy, is there a risk that they are sidelined? For instance, behind new issues like security of supply, we can see conversations about this uh, at the time of uh, COVID, this famous uh, supply chain fragility. We can see this now about energy or food uh, or uh, cereals burnt, and uh, Vladis, do you see a risk there? And what is your take? Bernd first. Perhaps one remark on possible items, uh, takeaways. And I would just come back to Lucy on the innovation. So uh, we need really companies innovate in sustainability and uh, in climate change fight and so on. Uh, and sometimes, um, uh, my impression was that in Europe, we forgot this part of innovation. So there was really try to stabilize, preserve the existing situation. I remember quite well the discussion I had with the European steel industry, specifically also with the steel company in my constituency. Um, but now there is a more move uh, uh, regarding innovation. And I sh think we should really focus on this move uh, and uh, uh, make our uh, economy more competitive, also based on a different way of uh, production, so innovation for transformation. And this, of course, leads also to the question how to work forward with uh, the uh, trade policy. There is a risk, no doubt about. We have this national reflex. Uh, uh, remember, uh, with the corona pandemic, even member states in the European Union uh, made an export um, uh, 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 restriction to masks and others. Now we have some export restriction regarding food. And uh, now we, we have to be careful on that. I guess the proper answer is solidarity and not nationalism. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Vladis, uh, for the, uh, your concluding uh, answer. And then uh, Geneviève will wrap up. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, question. Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, Russia's uh, uh, invasion in uh, Ukraine, I think first we must uh, focus on uh, uh, things. Uh, so to say first things first, so we must focus on stopping the war meaning putting maximum pressure on uh, Russia, including so sanctions, and providing maximum uh, support to uh, Ukraine via all different means which are in our uh, disposal. Uh, because uh, the sooner we stop uh, the war, the sooner we can uh, return to, uh, uh, to uh, normality on a num number of uh, aspects. Uh, then uh, if we look uh, at the influence uh, of uh, this war on different uh, work streams, uh, well, uh, as already mentioned, uh, 
uh, issues we need to address right now, security of supply, uh, energy, uh, food security, uh, and uh, we are uh, working on all those uh, aspects. So first on energy. Uh, we came with a Repower EU uh, communication where we, among other things, outlined the need to move away from uh, dependency on uh, Russian uh, gas, oil and coal, uh, uh, which uh, will be done via different uh, uh, tracks, uh, obviously diversification of supply and what we discussed uh, uh, LNG supplies and so on and so forth, but also speeding up the green transition, rolling out of renewables, improving energy uh, efficiency. So uh, uh, in a sense, uh, the fact that we now need to uh, cut our dependency from uh, a supplier which is explicitly threatening us uh, uh, is not contradicting the aims which we want to achieve through the European uh, Green uh, uh, Deal. Uh, so uh, it's a question uh, that we need to do a number of things uh, much more urgently than we probably initially uh, thought. Well, on food security, that's a major issue uh, which we need to uh, address. Uh, and it's not so much a food security question within the EU, because we are largely self-sufficient on kind of key uh, agricultural products. Uh, but uh, also in the EU, it's going to be a question of food affordability. And we came with a communication also uh, showing how we could address this. But it's going to be food security issue in a number of uh, uh, developing countries. In some regions, there's high dependency on uh, Ukraine uh, wheat uh, exports, like in Northern Africa and uh, Middle East. So we'll need to see also what as an EU we can do to address this uh, food uh, security issue, because that's a very uh, real uh, issue we need to deal with. And uh, well, uh, they mentioned this security of supply, I mentioned Russian hydrocarbons, but equally we are having a uh, uh, disruption of supply chains across the board on a number of raw materials. And we already started a mapping exercise, how we can diversify this uh, supply of uh, raw uh, materials from other uh, more reliable uh, uh, suppliers uh, and uh, uh, and uh, will be uh, uh, moving forward also in that uh, direction. So in short, there are some short-term responses which we need to uh, deal with and need to respond uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, but if we look in a, a medium-longer uh, perspective, it uh, should not uh, distract us from uh, the uh, green uh, deal and in some aspects like uh, reducing our dependency on uh, uh, Russian fossil fuels, it should actually accelerate our effort on the green deal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valdis, uh, Mr. Vice President. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to Bernd Lange, Lucy Parker, James Taunton. Thank you for a very rich and very interesting uh, discussion. I will make four points. First of all, uh, recognition of the fact that the EU is showing the way in this domain of greening trade. All of you are on the same line on that. Importance of maintaining the direction uh, despite the crisis. Then importance of being all together. Uh, here we have the commission, we have the parliament, we have uh, civil society and we have business and all recognize that they have a role to play and they have to do it together. And finally, uh, the conviction that we shall maintain the, di the direction, but even go further. There is margin for progress and there are ideas on how to do so and in what domains i just give you two two words biodiversity as much as climate and enforcement as much as regulate so thank you very much again all of you and uh, looking forward to future debates with you on this very important question Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.